delight to be able to welcome back the Dinkins. Uh, I'm going to start with Barbara this time. Uh, she has her undergraduate degree uh, in biology from a university whose name I cannot mention. <laughs> they are number one in women's basketball. Uh, uh, she, however, redeemed herself with a master's degree in marine science from the University of Tennessee. While she was in graduate school, she founded a biological consulting agency, and that biological uh, consulting firm uh, became later Dinkins Biological Consulting, uh, involving her and her husband, Jerry. Uh, they have been at it more than 30 years now. Uh, Barb has been surveying uh, and for and identifying snails and mussels uh, throughout that period. Uh, and she has been doing this all over <coughs> North America. Now turning briefly, much too briefly, to Jerry, uh, who has his undergraduate degree in wildlife and fisheries science from the University of Tennessee after having grown up in Knox County, has his master's degree in ecology from the University of Tennessee. Uh, he studied in graduate school under Dr. David Etnire, famous name that we all, I think, recognize. Uh, he is, uh, uh, he has a certification, a federal uh, fish and wildlife permit to conduct surveys for and translocations of threatened and endangered fish, mussels, and snails for 22 states. Uh, he is the co-owner of Denkins Biological Consulting, uh, but he now is full-time with McClung Museum. Since 2007, he has been curator uh, for Natural History and Malacology at uh, McClung Museum of Natural History and Culture. Uh, he became full-time uh, fairly recently. Uh, the Malacology collection uh, at McClung Museum is world-renowned. Uh, here is a little note he also appended to this brief bio sketch. Perhaps, he says, the greatest achievement, he says, occurred in 1985 when he convinced today's co-presenter to marry him. <laughs> this was especially notable given that at the time he was unemployed. <laughs> and so with great delight I present Gary and Barbara Denkins speaking on Knox County mussels and snails the good, the bad, and the gone. So, the one correction, she went to the University of Delaware for her master's. Yes, I'm not redeemed. But she did go to the University of Delaware, and we went to the game last night, and I lost the bet. Um, so, as Dr. Linda said, I went to UT, and... Um, it worries me a little bit that Gary McCracken is here. <laughs> uh, and he knows why, because he can't ask the question that I, would, I asked him a long time ago when I was taking his first class he taught UT. But there may be a spelling test right here. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks for you know, so many friendly faces that I see here. Uh, old uh, colleagues of mine from graduate school are here. Um, and so let's get started. <coughs> so, um, as Dr. Lina said, I'm the curator of the Moss Collection at UT at the McClung Museum. And uh, we have three, you know, Moss is, 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 is a diverse phyla. Um, and the, our collection really is focused on three groups. Freshwater mussels, aquatic snails, and land snails. And what we're going to be talking about today are freshwater mussels and the land snails. And we have uh, a, a large collection, um, and um, it's not a, it's, it's 
we have about half the collection digitized. We have an, a, about as many in backlog as we have actually in, in the catalog portion, and we're working towards getting that online. So, a little bit about the statistics of the, of the collection here. It's the largest one in Tennessee. Uh, it's in, in the southeast, it's second only to the North Carolina and Florida State Museums. Um, it's perhaps the largest on-campus um, Moss collection in the southeast. Tennessee, and you'll hear this number more than once today, uh, Tennessee has historically had 139 species of freshwater mussels. All 139 species are in our collection, including the extinct ones, which were there's 15 or 16. Um, and um, we have, there's uh, 51 species of freshwater mussels in Tennessee that are on the federal endangered species list. We have all 51 there. Uh, Tennessee has 95 counties. We have mussels from 91 of the 95 counties. We have mussels from 42 of 49 states. There's no <coughs> mussels in Hawaii, so we have a pretty good representation. Uh, across the U.S., 80, 89 species are federally listed. We have 72 of them in our collection. So that's one of the reasons we have uh, a lot of interest in our collection by state and federal agencies, is because we have such a representation of a very rare species. 300 species in North America, you'll hear me talk more about that later. We have 250 of them, and uh, the mussels are on all continents except Antarctica, and we have mussels from all continents. Now, the talk today is kind of broken into to two parts, the good, and then the bad and the ugly. Mm -hmm. And so, the good part is going to be handled by my good wife um, of 30 years. Three years. <laughs> <laughs> Three years. Um, and so, good save. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and now here's Barbara Lincoln to talk about land sales in Knox County. Thank you all for coming. Um, as you just said, I'm here to tell you good news about the, the status of mollusks in our county. Um, just a, a little background in how I got interested in this. Uh, as Mark had mentioned earlier, I'm trained as a marine biologist invertebrate and spent my entire career identifying marine invertebrates and living in landlocked states um, most of the time to be able to hear and see. And which I enjoyed, but about five years ago I decided that it was time after living in the biodiversity heart of the, of the continental US, I believe. Um, it was time just to learn a new group, something that was close to me. So um, I had some mild interest in land snails due to a project that Jerry and I were working on several years back in um, Sherwood, Tennessee. So one day I went out to my front yard, backyard, we lived in the woods, and just did half an hour of, of casual collecting and found 11 species. And at that point, I was hooked. And those of you that know me know that I'm very difficult to hike with because I'm always falling behind and, and they look back and all you can see is my butt coming out of the out of a bush looking for snails. And it doesn't matter what country we're in, right? <laughs> I, I have compassion about the subject. Um, anyway, the, the, it turned into um, a um, project that Jerry and I put together to figure out exactly what the diversity of land snails is in Knox County. Um, just a little bit about um, land snails. They're probably more diverse than you might think. Um, although our North American land snails are not colorful like they are in the tropics or in Hawaii, um, they're very diverse in their shapes and sizes. Um, here's a, a few examples of that. Um, if you look at the, the, one, the vertigo at the top, um, that's typical of a snail that has an aperture that's guarded by, by um, teeth. Um, and there's these teeth in the different species is um, very diagnostic of which species they are. One of my favorites are stentatremas that have that, instead of a wide opening, they have that little slit. And you can imagine the snail regularly slipping itself in and out of that little slit. A little slit, um, which is one reason that it's sometimes it's nice to not have a back photo. Um, the, one of, the anguish spire is, as we call it, one of our few 
so-called charismatic snail, just because it's got color on it. But most of them are brown, white, or um, variations of the colors you see here. Um, oops. So, um, a little bit about land snails. And when I talk about land snails, I'm also including slugs in there. Slugs are land snails without a shell or with a real reduced slug or an internal I mean, shell or an internal shell. Um, they're vital components of the terrestrial environment. Um, we, they serve as detritivores, herbivores, predators, uh, and they're, um, they also serve as food for insects, birds, reptiles, and amphibians, small mammals. Um, one of my favorite pictures that I took is, is that one there on the, on the right where you see a, um, the larvae of a firefly, a predaceous firefly actually feeding on a, on a snail. Um, these carabid ground beetles also have, have evolved, as, as this larvae, also have evolved a longish snout to um, help in eating their favorite prey, which is the land snail. Um, they're an important source of calcium for birds, salamanders, and um, even small rodents. Uh, okay, now I'm going to talk about the history of collecting in Knox County of land snails. Um, there's been, this, the collections started in the late 1800s um, with the, some of the people we see here, here in the top. Um, in particular, Henry Pillsbury wrote a four volume monograph that we used extensively in order to help with the identifications of the snails. My favorite collector is, um, didn't publish anything that I know of, but her name is, or she's referred to in, in the literature by the men that, that publish all the manuscripts um, as Mrs. George Andrews, and she was a, a native or a, a resident of Knoxville in, in the early 1900s. Um, that's a time, of course, that women were, there was very few women in science, so it was Always nice to see her name, and she's, I believe, so, several species are named after her. Um, Leslie Hubert is a more um, recent notable collector of land snails. He spent most of his long life of 97 years, I think, um, uh, collecting land snails throughout North America and mainly in the eastern part, the southeastern part. Um, he collected 43,000 lots of snails, introduced 108 different molluscan ta taxa, and most importantly to our study here in Knox County, he um, published a distributional atlas of, of snails, and um, it was listed by county, every county um, in the eastern North America, and it's been really useful to us to figure out what records, what the historical records have snails were in this county. Um, he found, um, he listed 76 species here. There's a couple other references that we got our historical records from, but mainly Hubert's uh, publication was the best help for that. Uh, Knox County has a total area of about 1,300, 1,400 meters square, uh, kilometers squared, 3% um, of which is water. It borders seven counties and contains four major rivers. The rivers, um, Jared will talk more about in his talk, but um, they're also important to land snails because of the way they affect it, the topography and make it more suitable for snail habitat. Um, I'll mention that a little bit later. The Knox, Knox County is encompassed within the Southern Appalachian Ridge and Valley physiographic region, which is a region that that has north, east, southwest trending ridges and valleys that, or ridges that are bisected by streams. And um, the streams, or the, um, the valleys cut through a, stand, a sandstone cap over a um, calcium-rich limestone layer. And this makes really great um, habitat for calcium-loving plant snails. And that's why there's such a high diversity of plant snails here. And there's a um, <coughs> schematic view of the Ridge and Valley land features. Um, you, you see the darker green is 
indicating where the ridges are. It's a little bit less, um, or a little bit more complicated south of the Tennessee River. There's, and there's the, the major rivers, you get the Clinch, the Tennessee, and French Broad, and the Holston, that all come together there. We chose 116 sites to collect snails from, and these were chosen using topographic maps and um, some other re resources. We tried to concentrate on the limestone rich forests and bluffs of the county, because that's where most of the land snails were, but also we hit as many different habitats as we could find, such as wetland, floodplains, urban areas, and caves. Here's a map of this the survey sites, um, we tried to get as good coverage as we could, but you can see that a lot of a lot of the sites are um, clustered, and these clusters indicate probably one of two different things. Um, a lot of the clusters are on very highly diverse um, habitat. For example, right here, course right out there on the other side of the river where you see those, those bluffs. Jerry and David Ett and I are used to go fishing and take me with them and drop me off at the bottom of the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> and they would attempt to catch fish and I would be climbing the cliff. It's better than dropping off the top of the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the, other, the other cluster, a lot of the clusters there are also because those are um, parks or easily accessible places that I didn't feel like I was going to be uh, shot <laughs> trespassing. Um, at each of the sites, we spent about three hours, one to three hours, searching for leaf litter, plants, the edges of rock, underneath bark, and rotting wood. We gathered. We also gathered soil and fine woody material and, and leaf litter from each site and place it in a bag to bring back to the lab to look, to go through, to look for the, the real tiny snail. Um, and we recorded habitat data for each site. Here's a different a picture of some of the different types of habitat. And my, there's some of my own collecting buddies there. Um, most of what we, where we, where we would find a lot of snails in is places like this, where with the side of wooded slopes with rocky outcrops, but we also looked in pastures and caves, um, cedar groves, and, um, and uh, you know, wet, the wetlands. So we took the, the uh, soil back to the laboratory, and the soil, it was like a mixture of, mixture of leaves and soil and, and everything else that you find right there on the forest floor, and we run it through a series of sieves, and then each faction would be picked through in order to extract all the snails. I'm not going to go into that, but that's how we would add those, of course, add those to our list. Um, this slide illustrates the size variation in the snails that we have here in the county. Um, it ranges from the largest one, the Sophis capnodes, which is about 35 millimeters at its maximum, to smaller the smaller micro snails in, in that one in particular is, is about one millimeter in, um, in, in diameter. Our list of snails in the county was made up of two different things. Of course, the, the field survey itself, but also the extensive um, work that we did looking through the historical records of Knox County and um, records in various museums. So we would look through the databases of museums and if we saw a Knox County record, if we could verify it, because there's a lot of mistakes made in identifications, if we could verify it ourselves or if the curator could would verify it for us, we would count it in the list. Um, so it was a our list of Knox Counties is made up of both these sources, both our field work and these historical records. So um, the, the database and museum research and literature research showed that historically, um, prior to our study, only 81 species were known in the county. 
which is a good number. But um, with our field work, we found 70 new county records mm. for a total of 151 species. Now, 11% of these are um, non-native to North America. Um, we found 15 new state records and three species previously known in Tennessee only from fossil records. We knew that before we did this that the southeast supports a high diversity of land sales. It's, it's in the literature and we expect it to find quite a bit. Um, the topography, geology, soil chemistry, and climate is very conducive to um, many species of snails. But the, um, with this study, we found more snails documented in our county than any other county in Tennessee. We didn't extend that to the other counties in the area, but it's, it's um, probably more than most in the southeast. Most of them have docu been not been documented right now in the southeast. Um, and we did find a study for the state of Louisiana that the entire state still didn't reach the number of snails that we had in their, in their study. Um, the question is, is Knox County unique in having all, all these, or is it just a case of under-reporting? Well, probably, almost definitely it's a case of under-reporting. If you look at this next slide, here's a picture of Knox County, and we did do an analysis of looking at the um, historical reporting of the, the seven counties that are around Knox County, and you can see that some of these numbers are really low. In particular, look at Jefferson County, just to the east of Knox, 11 species have been recorded there, which is ludicrous. Um, it's, a, it's a county that's about the same size or area as um, Knox County, and it's, um, it's within the Ridge and Valley, or the Valley and Ridge Physiographic Province, so it should have the same number of, or at least close to the same number of species as Knox County, so we would look, but it also has a little chunk of the um, Blue Ridge physiographic province, which means that it may have some, some snails. That, that province is, includes the um, Smoky Mountains, and so it may have a whole new group of species there if, if we just looked for them. So, um, like I said, it's probably a part, the, um, there's going to be a lot of underreporting of land snails in the future. So, 151 species, is this close to the true number that has, of snails that has, have ever inhabited? our county. Um, remember I said that the first records didn't, or haven't been pu weren't published until the late 1800s, which means that they were found after all our old growth was cut down. So there's a good chance that before the Europeans got over here, there were snails that, that lived here that were associated with this old growth forest, and we'll never see if they've been extirpated. But we'll never know. I like that picture. Mm -hmm. Well, what does this mean? Okay, we have the. Um, we always hear that worldwide biodiversity is crashing in so many faunal groups. Um, but here in Knox County, um, of the 51 land snails on our list, only 16 were <coughs> historical records that we didn't find in our survey, which se seems to indicate that at least for the last hundred years our biodiversity of land snails has been relatively stable. Um, so what are some possible reasons that we thought of for this, this um, stability of biodiversity of land snails here? Um, there's three ideas that uh, I'll speak briefly on. Um, the historical underreporting of micro snails, the resilience of snails to habitat alteration and, and non-native snails not being a threat yet. Um, Micro snails are snails that are, we define them as snails less than um, five millimeters in diameter. Thirty percent of the Knox County snails are micro snails, but 46 percent of the new county records were micro snails. Um, so to us that indicates that they are greatly underreported as in the, in the, um, in the, old, collect the old collections. I can tell you why. I think I know why. It's because it's really labor intensive and not that much fun to go through a lot of dirt. It's much more fun to be in the field with your butt up in the air looking for snails. 
while your companions say, let's go. <laughs> um, one one uh, example of this underreporting of uh, microsnails is the gastrocopic contractor, which is this snail. It was found in a vast majority of the sites we went to, yet it was a new county record. <laughs> Um, another reason for the stability of the plant snails and biodiversity might be the resilience of snails to past environmental um, alterations. In particular, clear cutting um, that's always going on, um, or has been always going on in the past hundred years here. Um, one idea that we had that may help explain the recolonization of our native snails back into patches of forests as they grow is um, the fact that most of the North American land snails are hermaphrodites. It's a lot easier to find a, a mate if you don't have to find the same as the opposite species. They can just find any snail of their species and, and reproduce, recolonize an area. Um, dispersal is relatively easy for snails, even though they don't, they don't crawl very far or very fast, um, they can easily disperse on the backs of animals as they move through an area. I've seen them on the backs of my dogs. Um, of course, floods can, can move them around, and, and they just seem to be able to um, recolonize the um, alterations as they recover <coughs> and become mature forests again. Um, in addition, they they can survive drought or, or periods of dry weather, but because of a process called estivation, where they can um, cover their aperture with a, a layer of mucus that, that dries out and it's almost like, it looks like saran wrap covering, covering the opening and protects the soft body tissue from desiccation and they can actually stay in estivation for a surprising long time until the conditions get better. Um, finally, um, non-native, the non-native snails in our field study um, were almost exclusively found in the urban or suburban or, or other, I should say, residential areas. They really weren't, didn't seem to be invading our natural areas or our parks and, and um, the, the forests where we found most of the non the non native species. I mean, most of the native species. So that's good news. That, that means that maybe it's it's not they're not going to come in as they do in many other fallen groups and actually take over. Let me look at kudzu. But there was one troubling um, specimen that we found, a specimen of slug that we found in um, Tyson Park, in the forest of Tyson Park called Aaron subfuscus. That is a slug that is causing a lot of trouble up in the northern states where it's taken over, it's, it's apparently knocked out the, our native slug fauna. In completely in some of these forests of its um, when we saw it when we were hiking through the um, border of um, Canada and Minnesota. It's the only slug we could find. So it's, it's apparently knocking out our native species and it was troubling to me to find it in our one of our forests. So that's not good news. But, um, like I said, for the past hundred years, it's, their diversity of land snails has remained relatively stable. But our, that doesn't mean that there's not nothing to worry about. Um, you know, the, the most, the greatest threat I think to our land snail diversity is just the spread of houses and urban urban sprawl. Um, there's no diversity of native snails in, in places like this, um, and, and of course we don't know what climate change is going to do to our the, uh, the population of these now. So now you, that was the good news. <laughs> <laughs> Hope everybody feels really uplifted right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, while you're doing the switch over, what is the do you know why the invasive species are more in the in the metropolitan areas? Uh, why they are, well, it, I guess it's an opportunistic thing. The, the, the native snails can't, can't make it there, and the, um, they come over mostly in, I mean, most of the ones that we found 
I meant, I meant to mention nurseries as well. Um, they come over because we bring plants over, and, and, uh, yeah. and they, they just that just happens to be where they can easily um, be colonized. I mean, there's probably other snails that come from other places that don't make it because they don't have the right uh, what they need to live. But, uh, we can find all kinds of cases. And now I'm going to depress you. Because if you work with uh, freshwater mussels, uh, it, it's a depressing fauna. Walt Clipple, who Walt has to attest, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're in trouble. So now we're going to talk about the bad and the gone. All right. So uh, in North America, we have about 300 species under current taxonomic arrangement. And that's changing constantly. Um, but right now, as of about a month ago, it's about 300 species. That's for the whole of, of uh, no, that's for U.S. and Canada. Mexico's still kind of a, an unknown. So U.S. and Canada, 300 species. In these 11 states right here, you have most of the fauna. 269 of the 300 species are here. And three, uh, or, well, uh, five states jump out at you. Alabama, Tennessee, uh, Georgia, and Kentucky. They're the top five. And in terms of the fishes, because that's how I was trained uh, in the fish world, those, those five states are, are the top as well, except Tennessee's top in terms of uh, fish diversity. Alabama is second in fish diversity. Um, Tennessee, they only have 300 species of freshwater fish in Tennessee. Thereabouts, thereabouts, okay. So anyway, 139 freshwater mussels in Tennessee, historically. Uh, state boundaries are artificial constructs, so they, they, they have, you know, there are political reasons why, where the boundaries are. They have nothing to do, usually, with topography or, or drainages. Uh, so if you look at drainages in North America, uh, two stand out, the Tennessee and the Cumberland system. Um, they're the top. And um, so Tennessee at 104 species. Cumberland at what, 89 species, and if you take these two river systems, of course they come together right before they, they flow into the Ohio River and the Mississippi, there's about 33 species of freshwater mussels that are only in these two river systems, and, and uh, a long time ago, uh, the fauna of the Tennessee and Cumberland system was, was called the Cumberlandian fauna, and uh, that's, it had, it's the highest degree of uh, endemicity, so it has the highest percentage of endemic species of any two river systems uh, you know, in North America. Now, this is just a cute picture I like. It really, it, it's a repeat of other things, but um, my collections assistant, Kristen Irwin, took this picture. Uh, this is all 139 species uh, in Tennessee. And you, you see uh, the, 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 the range of color and um, and size, um, and even you know things like this, the, the giant washboard. That's a that's a relatively small, and they historically got the huge. Um, anyway, I just like that picture. All right. What do we know about our our, our state fauna? So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm kind of working my way from a bigger picture, which is North America, down to the state, and then we'll eventually get to to Knox County. So on the state level, uh, 139 species, uh, 111 of our 139 species are still here. Uh, now, they're not in you know, everywhere that they historically occurred, but they're still, we can still find them in our state waters. Uh, we have 10 species that were part of our historic fauna that is gone from our state, but they may still be found in other states like Georgia, Alabama, uh, Kentucky. We have three species that we really don't know if they're still with us or not. I mean, nobody's seen them in a few years, so I, I consider them to be unknown. And then we have uh, 15 species that are completely gone. And the ones that are completely gone are the, almost well, all of them are in one genus, Epiblasma. And that was a relatively short-lived mussel uh, as a group, and they lived in big river, shallow water habitat. And I'm, I'm talking about big river, I'm talking about like Lower Holston, Tennessee, Main Channel, and Cumberland. And if you think about those river systems, they're, you know, at least in the Tennessee, there's no shallow water habitat left. Or the Cumberland River system, there's no shallow water habitat left. It's all under impoundments. 
Oh, and um, in Tennessee, we have 52 species that are on the federal endangered species list. Now, here are the major drainages in the state of Tennessee and the number of species of freshwater mussels in each one of those drainages. Three of them jump out at you. The Holston River system is the top at 73 species. Um, the Clinch Pile at 71 species, and then the Duck. And we're going to get to the Holston in a minute. That's going to be sort of how I conclude my talk. The Clinch Pile, uh, historically 71 species. Uh, that's down to about 50 species now. The Duck at 62 species. That's down to maybe 40, 45 species. All right, now we're, now we're going to sort of focus in on Knox County. Barb's already talked about the major water bodies in our, in our county. Of course, you have the Holston, the French Broad, which come together right up here to form the Tennessee system. And then on our western border, we have the Clinch. We also have a number of fairly significant streams, uh, the most notable of which to me, because that's where I, I grew up on the banks of Beaver Creek, uh, is Beaver Creek. And then Bull Run Creek starts up in Union County. Up here, comes through the county, goes into Anderson County, eventually to the Clinch River. And then we have uh, some sub you know, direct tributaries to the Tennessee River, Hickory, Turkey, Sinking, and then the creeks that are, that are sort of right here where we are, first, second, third, and fourth creek. Um, and we'll talk about those a little bit more in a minute as well. Okay, let's talk about the Holston and the French Broad. The two rivers that come together to form the Tennessee system. The Holston is the smaller of the two, uh, a little less than 10,000 square kilometers, uh, average annual flow of uh, a little less than 5,000 cubic feet per second. The French Broad is a, is a, a larger system, uh, 13,000 square kilometers and a little less than 8,000 cubic feet per second annual flow. The whole, both these river systems have been chopped up by dams, and so uh, they are a series of disconnected uh, systems. So we have, and most of these dams were built in the early to mid-1900s. On the Holston, we have, what, seven? Boone, Fort Patrick, uh, South Holston, Wilbur, Watauga, Cherokee, and then three dams on the French Broad. And so the two that, that are probably the most significant of those dams are the Cherokee and the Douglas, and we're going to talk really going to focus on Cherokee Dam. Now, I want to talk about, just real quickly, uh, the, the fact that some of these are, are thermally stratified, have to create thermally stratified reservoirs. It means that they, they're deep enough that the bottom uh, layer stays very cold, and that's what's released, and so they have a cold water tail race. And that's, that has a significant effect on the freshwater mussel fauna. The physiography and geology of these two systems are really different, and it, it's kind of represented in our muscle community that's in, in both. Uh, the Holston is, is, is in, almost entirely in the Valley Ridge Vitrographic Province, which is a limestone do dominated, has limestone dominated geology, the very little sandstone. Uh, the streams in the Valley and the Ridge are relatively productive because they're limestone based. There's extensive sand, gravel, and shoals, which is ideal for, for freshwater mussel habitat. There are 73 species historically known from the French Broad. Interestingly, there's 19 of those species that were not in the French Broad, even though these systems are, are like sister drainages. The French Broad, on the other hand, is mainly Blue Ridge. Uh, which is, is a nutrient poor system. It's dominated by metamorphosed sedimentary rocks. I'm not a geologist. This is just what I can read about. So quartz and silica. Uh, except for the lower reaches of the French Broad, its, it's habitat is really more steep, gradient, boulders and cobbles. It had 53 species. Interestingly, only one that was uh, that, that it did not share with the French Broad. I mean, the host of the other. There's one species that was in the French Broad that was not in the host. Now, is that real? That may have just been, like Barb was talking about, with land snails uh, under reporting. Okay, what do we have today in the Holston River? Since that's our, our, our most diverse system, what do we have today? Historically, 73 species were down to 13. That's an 82% decline in the fauna. And of those 13, only 7 are showing signs of reproduction. 
uh, and that's just barely reproducing. We can, we can go out and occasionally find young mussels in the lower Holston River. Three of them that are significant, though, that are still hanging on in the lower Holston River, but the base is Scythius the sheep nose, which is federally endangered, and we occasionally find uh, young ones in the, in the very lower reach. Torbina rubrum, the pyramid pig toe, which is being looked at by the Fish and Wildlife Service right now to see if it warrants uh, protection on the Endangered Species Act. And then Lanceless abruptum, which is federally endangered. Uh, we're not seeing signs of reproduction in that species. What's wrong? Mainly Cherokee Dam. Cherokee Dam is, uh, is, has a cold water release. It's a hypolimnetic release. It has uh, a, a significant daily pulsing flow. So um, it's, there's 52 miles of the Holston River below Cherokee Dam. That's still free-flowing river, yes, but it's dramatically altered by what, what's happening, uh, what's coming out of, out of, the, whole, out of the Cherokee Dam. Uh, what about our other streams? Uh, there's my daughter-in-law and my granddaughter. <laughs> um, the other streams. So growing up in Knox County, I've always had an interest in the streams that uh, uh, are, are here. And I've been in most of them. I've spent a lot of time poking around, looking for mussels. Uh, as a kid, um, that's how I kind of got out of my chores, is I'd go find a creek, especially Beaver Creek, and stomp around in it. There are mussels left in some of these. Uh, Beaver Creek, we don't really know what the historic fauna was of Beaver Creek. It was never really surveyed extensively. Uh, there are mussels in the lower end, in the Carnes community. Um, there's maybe half a dozen species. There's a few up in the upper part of the Beaver Creek watershed up in the Gibbs community. Bull Run Creek, I also spent a lot of time in Bull Run Creek. I, I have an aunt and uncle that have a farm on Lower Bull Run Creek. I've spent a lot of time looking. Uh, there's a few species in the upper part of Bull Run. Um, I spent time with uh, my mentor, Paul Parmley, in Turkey Creek looking around for shells. We found a few fragments that were just little pieces, we couldn't really identify them because they were small pieces. An interesting uh, tidbit of history is First Creek, right here, which is just up here. Um, no mussels left, and there's no mussels left in First, Second, Third, or Fourth Creek that I've been able to find. Uh, Estabrook, I can't remember his first name. Here you remember? Uh, president Estabrook, he was one of the early presidents of the University of Tennessee. Estabrook Hall was his name after what? Oh, okay. Okay. Well, he lost his muscle name, too. So. <laughs> um, Estabrook was a, a sort of a, a naturalist, and um, he often would wander around and collect mussels and snails. And he was, he was um, uh, friends with a guy at the Philadelphia Academy of Science named Isaac Lee, who uh, I jokingly refer to as Dr. Mayhem, because Isaac Lee um, had this penchant for describing species. And anytime Lee got a specimen from a new creek that he'd never gotten specimens from before, he would name it a new species. Uh, one species of freshwater mussel, Lee described 94 times. <laughs> uh, yeah. Estabrook collected a species of mussel out of First Creek and sent it to Lee at the Philadelphia Academy of Science, and Lee described it as Unio Estabrookianus, Estabrook, Estabrookianus. And um, so we, you know, we almost had a, a university president with a patronym. Unfortunately, Lee also described this species multiple other times that we now know it's, you know, had an earlier name, so we lost the, he lost, not only did Estabrook lose his building, he lost his, <laughs> his muscle name. Joseph. Joseph, Joseph. okay. Okay. Now, the other thing is that's, that, you know, I, I, I kind of list what's wrong with these creeks. Um, uh, but more significantly, they're now hydrologically disconnected by reservoirs. Uh, so there's not going to be, you know, if you, if you try to, you know, restock some of these streams with mussels, it, it'd be, they'd have a difficult time because they're now just, they're all hydrologically disconnected. Um, I will make a real short note about the Clinch River, especially the lower Clinch River. It had a, an incredible fauna. Um, about six months ago, Dr. Tim Bowman, he's the curator of archaeology, Tim brought me a box, uh, several boxes of shells that 
tenant found down the bowels of, of the McClung Museum. And in the box were uh, several hundred mussel shells. And over the next several days, we went through them and found 51 species from one place uh, on the Lower Clinch River. Unfortunately, this whole section of the Clinch now is under Melvinville Reservoir, so the mussels are gone from there. So, that was, that's the gone. Now here's the bad. Um, the bad are these two things, uh, particularly this one, the zebra mussels. They're coming. They're here. They're out here in this river right now. Uh, but they're very few and far between out here. Uh, zebra mussels were introduced into North America in about the mid-80s. And uh, they are, they're not a mussel so much, they're, they're a bivalve. Uh, so they don't have the same life strategy as our freshwater mussels do. They don't require fish hosts, for example, for their young. Uh, they like cold, oxygenated water. The Clinch River now below Nars Dam is paved with zebra mussels. Um, zebra mussels have, have gotten into Nars Reservoir and uh, they have marched up Nars Reservoir. They're all the way up to where the free flowing section of the Clinch come into Nars Reservoir. So far as we can tell, they've stopped there, and it's probably has to do with the warm water of the Clinch keeps them, you know, at bay. Um, but they, they, you know, they're here, and it's probably a matter of time before they make their way up to the Lower Holston. And once they hit that cold, oxygenated water, there's nothing to stop them to to going up to Cherokee Dam. And when that happens, it may be too late to try to change how Cherokee releases to reintroduce mussels to it. Asian clams were introduced into North America in the 1930s, and uh, like uh, the zebra mussel, they do not require fish hosts, so they've been able to spread as well. Now, so what do we know about, say, these two molluscan groups in Knox County? As Barb said, Knox County's land sale fauna is diverse, more diverse than we ever thought, almost by two times. It's stable and it's relatively intact. All the species that historically occur here are still here. Um, invasive species have come in, but to date they don't really look like they're having an effect. On the other hand, our mussels. We have, Knox County had, I'm not even talking about you know, the stuff that's out here in Tennessee, but main channel Tennessee, uh, because mostly what was in the Holston also came down here in Tennessee. But um, Knox County had a diverse muscle farm. If you combine what was in the Clint with what was in the Holston, uh, we had a lot of species. It's been affected by reservoirs, ultra flow regimes, and obviously urbanization. Um, can can something be done? Well, maybe if, if we could get uh, the a different release type of release from Cherokee dams where it was warmer and not so pulsed uh, to reflect natural conditions. We could, we could recover the fauna. Uh, but we have invasive bivalves and it's a matter of time before they, they occupy the lower Holston River. Uh, there are a lot of people that helped us with this, especially with the Lansdale stuff. Um, and uh, we'd like to acknowledge all of them. Um, Hugh Faust, uh, uh, for the muscles, I want to call out Hugh Faust, who's a, a colleague and a friend who has property on the Lower Holston River. And Hugh is, is spends a lot of his time digging shells out of the banks and, uh, and telling me what he's finding. Um, Barb, you want to shout out to anybody? Or? I'd like to shout out to all the people that helped me with this. I mean, I could not have done this without a lot of help. A lot of work, and I have, especially the, the museum curators that, that volunteered their, their time <coughs> to, to helping someone that knew nothing about snails that taught me how to how to what I was doing wrong and that kind of thing. Um, the other people, the people that helped um, contribute snails. Uh, Nick Watson contributed one of the uh, cave natural cave species. I don't have found another one. Um, and um, like I said, at the bottom there, um, Amy and Wayne, they and are some people that live in North Carolina that gave up hours of their time helping me with learning to identify these things. So, yeah, I'm sure I really appreciate that. And also the landowners. And for the most part, I did try to get their permission when I went on there. And um, 
a lot of people were, they, it was a lot easier than I thought. It was, I was, I've never done this before, and I was scared to go up to people and say, hey, can I go walk on your land? And for the most part, they were very generous and very, very interested in what we're doing. But there's, all of, all of that and our former graduate students can attest to the fact that uh, if you spend a lot of time with Ed and I, you learn how to trespass. <laughs> <laughs> and then you learn how to talk your way out of somebody, <laughs> somebody wanting to throw you in jail most of the time. I will have to say I have been thrown in jail in Mississippi, Kentucky, and Tennessee. <laughs> he taught you how to schmooze with him. <laughs> better than being shot. Yeah. <laughs> so, questions? Questions. Can you characterize what pulsing all that means? It means that uh, the discharge goes from a fairly low volume of water coming out to a very high volume of water coming out. And it has to do with uh, generation of electricity. Okay, what kind of time period? Uh, it can be several times in one day and go up and down. Yes? What do you mean by hydrologically disconnected? Because there, there's that they still share exactly. water, right? They do, uh, but uh, you they're disconnected in, in, the, in the biological sense. In other words, freshwater mussels require a, a host for their young. They require a fish host. And some species of mussels are very, are very particular with species of fish they need for their, their babies. And so um, some mussels require only fish that that fish that only live in very shallow water habitat. So the, the species of the, the fish that live in this deep water habitat, they can't tolerate the reservoir, so they're gone. So then the mussels can't, you know, sort of distribute themselves through the reservoirs and back up by the streams because their fish hosts are gone. How does, how does that work? I'm not familiar with the fish hosts. Okay. Um, I didn't get into this because it's such a, it's such a fascinating and complex uh, issue. Okay, the 50 foot level there. Okay, and so um, um, mussels require a host for their young because mussels are sedentary and they live in a, in a world for the most part that's going one direction, that's downstream. So if they, uh, if they just release their young into the water column and they passively float it downstream, eventually everything would be gone. So they, they evolved with fish in this way of attracting the fish in close enough. And the female, when she's fertilized, she will attach her young onto a fish. And uh, then that fish then will transport her young to wherever. And then uh, that parasitic stage of the muscle lasts anywhere from a few weeks to uh, you know maybe a couple months, at which time the muscle grows its shell and drops off. The, the degree of mimicry that mussels exhibit to try to lure a fish in close enough to attach their young to it is, is remarkable. There's one group of mussels that are in the Gulf Slope, uh, so they're in Georgia and Alabama, and the female, there's four species that do this. They're all in one group. They actually create a little fish form about as long as your finger that looks exactly like a fish. It has eye spots, it has fake fins, it has lateral lines, and all it is is a Trojan horse. It is just a uh, a thin membrane with pigment to make it look like a fish and has internal positive pressure. And inside are tens of thousands of baby mussels of that species. She will then play this lure out on a long translucent string, string that could be up to three meters long, and it will fish in the current. And as soon as a, and she's trying to target a, usually a, a centrarchid or a, a larger, you know, fish like a bass or bluegill, that group. As soon as the bass or bluegill or, or sunfish makes connection to that lure, the positive pressure erupts the, uh, the membrane and the babies come out and then attach to the gills of the fish, which then swims away. That's just one out of, you know, 300. Yeah. That's Actually, a it's like other, four out of 300. That's a whole other... Uh, that's a lecture in itself. <laughs> yeah. There's some muscles and, and uh, so one of the ways we categorize muscles is, is how they reproduce and um, and so we sort of group them accordingly. Uh, there's one group of mussels that will take their young and put them into a little uh, worm-like looking thing. And it can look like a black fly or uh, a little minnow, and they actually spit them out. And they will 
depending upon the, 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 the species of mussel, they may be targeting pelagic, you know, you know, midwater minnows, or they may be targeting benthic feeding minnows, or, or minnows that feed on the bottom. And so that, that little fish or worm lure will either go in the, in the middle of the water or the bottom of the water, depending upon what species of fish that, that, that mussels evolved with. And so they actually will float downstream. And if you've seen pictures, I don't have any, I didn't bring any pictures, but some of the, 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 the mimicry of this, this little lure is just spectacular. It looks exactly what it is they're trying to, to imitate. But you were saying even if those fish hosts were still available, the environment for the mussels is gone. Well, I mean, the, a lot of these mussels, uh, you know, are, are uh, prefer clean substrates, clean gravel and cobble. That's why the Holston was such a, a, a mecca for mussels. And out in this reservoir, the bottom is just meters deep soft silt. And so the heavy shell mussels would just would sink down in it and they, you know, they'd, they'd suck it. That's why out there's hardly any mussels out here in the main channel. Time for maybe one more question. I got about land snails. With land snails, is the number of species sort of the same as like the freshwater snails and mussels, where everybody is kind of saying that all these things were synonymized and maybe there's fewer species? Or are those species all known to be valid? Good Something question. Like, yeah. Um, <coughs> in freshwater mussel, well, in, in, in freshwater, for, go around the side to answer your question if I can. In freshwater fish, we're definitely in the age of splitters. So uh, there's a lot of sort of cryptic diversity, uh, a lot more diversity in freshwater fishes than we ever considered. With mussels, that's true too, but there was such a, a boom in um, overzealous descri describing of mussels and snails too that that there's actually more of a, a lumping going on now. <coughs> there's some cryptic speciation in, in mussels and snails that we, we, we understand, but the, I don't know, I'd say it's, I can't say that there's maybe 50 <coughs> 50 in terms of new species being described and, new, and, and existing species being collapsed. <coughs> so did you have a follow up? Well, yeah, I mean, just with the, uh, with the land snail. Are those being synonymized or split? There's a, I think they're pretty much staying relatively stable. I have not, I'm not an expert in that part of the field, but from what I've seen, um, it's not like these muscles, there weren't a million, I mean, that, that has been figured out when they were over, over described and um, it seems like the taxon and the at least the number of species is not varying by a lot in the last 50 years or so. Okay. But they're learning a lot more with the, with the um, they're not easy to identify because the, the you know, shell morphology is overlaps with different species. Mm -hmm. But they're learning a lot with um, uh, doing a lot of genetics, starting to arm them. And um, so that may and that's really just started in the past 20 years, so that may change the way that thing is. Another factor that, that's kind of playing into this is, as I said, Tennessee has 52 species of freshwater mussels that don't know what the species is. The federal government is obligated to try to recover those species, to get them off the endangered species list. So there's a lot of money being spent towards their study. Uh, Tennessee has one endangered snail, land snail, uh, even though we have, you know, a tremendous fauna. Uh, so there's, there's, there's not money being spent to try to recover them, and so there's not money being spent to try to understand the genetics of, of the fauna either. Anybody else have a question? I was just wondering, what does the what species sort of environmental activities are occurring to try to help save them? Um, most states and I'm talking about freshwater mussels and freshwater snails. Most states have hatcheries now that are that are designed to, to raise mussels in captivity and to propagate them. Uh, kind of like what conservation fisheries is doing with fish. Um, there's the most and there's a number of, of federal 
eight uh, federal uh, hatcheries now designed that are built just specifically for freshwater mussels. So uh, they're raising them in captivity and then putting them back into uh, streams and rivers where they used to occur but no longer occur because of water quality problems. The, the problem with mussels is um, a lot of places where they disappear from, the habitat's no longer there to support the mussels. So there's only, you know, there's not many places you can restore them to. And let's all thank uh, Jerry and Barb for a marvelous.